When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and he said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way as you have believed. Let it be done for you. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Sometimes occasions of life cause the preacher to pause and reconsider what he intended to say. I don't usually give you too many personal anecdotes, but as I said before service, my experience last night uh, with my daughter Naomi, her cluster of seizures, that desperation for relief, the host of emergency personnel in our living room, a trip to the ER and then to Children's in Milwaukee, all of that brought today's text into sharp relief. That's only one of the main probably four major themes. There's the gift of faith. There's the nature of authority, both of God and of man. There is the gospel going out to all nations. And then, of course, there is Jesus' gift of healing. We can't cover it all today. Don't worry, I won't try. But in yesterday's Congregation at Prayer video, of course, you can watch on replay, we considered the nature of authority, both of God and man, Today we kick off National Lutheran Schools Week, which reflects this year's theme verses from Matthew's Gospel. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, through the gifts of baptism in the Word, I am with you always even to the end of the age. And so, of course, we heard today of the Gentile soldiers, both old and new, being given God's extraordinary gifts of healing and with it, faith. But, of course, Naomi's condition has given me pause to consider Jesus' promise of healing and the faith required to believe that promise to be true. As you might know, or maybe not, a few of my children have a disorder that manifests seizures, among other conditions. Most of their symptoms are managed well with medicines, but Naomi was our first diagnosis and the most severe. When I first communicated this to family and friends, way back when she was two years old, I called it a devastating diagnosis. We kind of knew that it would be something that we'd struggle with the rest of her life. And for the last 12 years, we've been playing, I guess, whack-a-mole with those seizures, trying different medications, different diets, supplements, all sorts of things, to try to keep the seizures under control. We've prayed and prayed for healing, or at least treatment, however the good Lord wills to give it, either by medicine or technology or science or surgery or, frankly, a miracle. So I understand something about this leper and his devastating disease. I understand the compassion of the centurion for his paralyzed servant. Both leprosy and paralysis are incurable by any ancient and most modern medicine or technique. Like Naomi's seizures, they're not going to go away. The best we can hope for, by sense or by reason, is to reduce their frequency and severity. But by the disease's very nature, it is incurable. And we've learned to live with this, what Paul calls, thorn in the flesh. But today, I think Jesus wants me and you to have a bigger faith than that. Why do we stop short of actually asking God to do what seems impossible for us? Why can't God the Father just remove the tumors from the brain, miraculously and spontaneously? Our rational and skeptical minds think that 
Our God is too big for that because our needs are too little. Why would we pray for such a thing? So, of course, God has left it to us, to our own ingenuity and inv- uh, innovation to accomplish maybe what only he can do. Hmm. And yet here in St. Matthew's recording for us in the Gospel, we have two of the many times God has done just that. Something extraordinary, miraculous for two people for whom medical science, even today, would have little to offer. So I asked myself this morning, can Jesus heal Naomi like that today? And can I have such great faith. There are two people in the Gospels whom Jesus said had great faith, like the centurion, also the Canaanite woman. No doubt this is what people would want to hear most from the lips of their Savior, that commendation. But so often their conceptions about a great faith A strong, good, and true faith are entirely false, just like ours. What does Jesus mean by great faith? A great faith believes nothing great about itself. That's the first thing we can say with certainty. Like the centurion, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. The centurion believed that he was a most unworthy sinner. He was an officer of the Roman garrison. He had been out in the field. He lived a rugged life. His job was full of hardships and exertion, and he knew what was wrong with himself and what he lacked. But he had respect for the will and command of God. Others could speak for him. He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation and he has built our synagogue. That's how Luke records it. He is worthy, even though he said he wasn't. But he does not think of himself in terms of his own greatness. Neither did the Canaanite woman. She thought it perfectly natural to be counted among the dogs who had no right to eat the children's bread, she says. And yet, she was to hear from Jesus, just like the centurion, that she had great faith. So again, what does Jesus mean by a great faith? A great faith is, therefore, not a great faith in oneself, but it is a faith that believes great things about Christ. The woman continued to pray, Lord, help me. She knew to whom she should turn. This is what a great faith knows. Yes, it knows its own weakness, but thinks something of the great power of the Savior. Therefore, it says, I'm not worthy, but... Only say a word, and my servant will be healed. I am receiving the just rewards of my deeds, but Jesus, think of me. I have not deserved it, but I wait like little dogs under the table, hoping that some of those crumbs of grace and mercy might be mine. Lord, if you will, you can. Heal my daughter, and she will be healed. Can I pray like the Canaanite woman for my daughter? Would you think it too spiritual, too hokey, too woo to do so? There is still one more thing that marks great faith, and you heard it just a moment ago. Say the word. Say only one word. We learn this from the centurion. More than anything else, great faith believes in the word of Christ. There is no faith apart from the word of Jesus. Faith needs this word. And it takes firm grip on this word, Jesus, and holds fast to him. By itself, we know nothing but mistakes and failures, inadequacies and hopelessness. We often doubt that there is any faith in us at all. But there is this sure saying that is worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the foremost of them. Great faith, therefore, can reside in a person, but it doesn't come from them. Such a person feels nothing but weakness in himself. 
Great faith says, I believe, help my unbelief. Great faith can ask without ceasing for healing that God alone can give. And so I live trusting that as God, the Holy Trinity, has given my daughter Naomi new life and baptism, forgiven her sin, that God will, prom- will keep his promises. And he has promised to preserve her life both now and most certainly into the resurrection on the last day. When I think that I have failed in being a Christian and praying as I ought, I can't seek feelings or wait for victories or look for successes to believe in and to witness about. That's not going to do. Nor can I dig about in my heart to discover a strong and victorious faith. As Ezekiel will tell us in Bible study later, all that's there is a heart of stone. No, I can only be steadfast in prayer, constantly go to Jesus, awaiting a word from his lips like the centurion, like the Canaanite woman, like the leper, and humble myself under the mighty hand of God, that in due time he may exalt both me, you, and Naomi. And his word is true for me, for you, for Naomi, for Gentile soldiers, for their servants. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is now the kingdom of heaven. By this word, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.